Let's get into the juicy question that a lot of people have been talking about pro high volume, pro low volume, necessarily just trying to represent the data the best we can, then factor in context of the, the data. The research question was not the relationship between hypertrophy and strength gains directly. So whether additional hypertrophy is leading to additional strength gain and the nature of of those adaptations. They're qualitatively positive with diminishing returns and no clear inverted yield. And they're different measurements. We don't really view them as fundamentally different curves. However, strength has much stronger diminishing returns and that creates this kind of envelope or this window of hypertrophy that is not explained by strength gains, or at least that is the claim. And so that is kind of, to me, that's the best faith relationship of kind of the spirit of the confusion that has been in the community. Let's get into the juicy question that a lot of people have been talking about, and there's been various viewpoints, is, is what I would say. And let's put our cards on the table after going back and forth on this for more than six months now and uh, attempting to record this, not attempting to record the podcast, but scheduling the podcast, preparing for this podcast multiple times, some false starts, yada, yada. Let's get to the question of why do these curves disagree? These are both volume curves. One is hypertrophy, one is strength. And man, high volumes are just so good for, for hypertrophy, clearly. And high volumes are just so bad for strength, clearly. Why? How is that possible? How is that possible? So let's discuss further this potential difference here, okay? I want to walk through a series of considerations here. Zach, do you want to go through like some premises yeah. that are required to get to certain conclusions before we go through our thought process on the matter. Yeah, 100%. So anytime these kind of discussions come up, I think it's crucial to try to understand and really understand the arguments before you, you know, start to, to, to put your position or jump on one side of the fence, right? And so that was one of the reasons we've waited on this podcast is just we want to really, really understand both perspectives and come at things, again, trying to be as objective and as transparent as possible to say what is the underlying data actually um, suggesting. And so I think it is important to steel man the, the kind of the claim that's being made so that we can evaluate it as objectively as possible. So the, the kind of this overall spirit of the argument goes something like this. And this is just, like I said, a series of four bullet points and then an ultimate conclusion that follows from that. And then we'll kind of attack it from there. So looking at the, the visual here, this will kind of helpful to, to think about as I kind of describe this. So if I pivot this slightly. So the first is we observe a positive dose response relationship between weekly training volume and changes in muscle size, and that continues through high volumes. So a positive dose response relationship, even around 10 sets here, it continues to trend upwards, right? The second one is we do not observe a positive dose response relationship between a weekly training volume and changes in strength at high volumes. So they're getting at the point that things quote unquote plateau at this point right around here, around 10 sets or so, things peter out, there's no additional gains to be had is the claim. Three, changes in muscle size size that are due to increasing contractile protein content. So think the things like myosin, actin, the actual components of muscle that contract and produce force, those correlate strongly with changes in strength or strength capacity. So if you are gaining muscle from contractile proteins, you're also going to be gaining strength. Those things trend together. Four, we do not observe a strong correlation between changes in muscle size and strength capacity at high volume. So that's what this red area is indicating. It's a, the correlation is decreasing because strength is flattening out while hypertrophy is still trending upwards. So the conclusion is, thus, those changes in muscle size at high volumes right here, or this area in the red, must be due to factors other than increasing the contractile protein content. And so there's multiple hypotheses that are out there. Um, you'll touch on those in a second, but that's kind of the general idea. Hey, we see a really positive dose response relationship with hypertrophy, obviously still has diminishing returns. However, strength has much stronger diminishing returns. And that creates this kind of envelope or this window of hypertrophy that is not explained by strength gains, or at least that is the claim. Um, and so that is kind of, to me, that's the best faith relationship of kind of the spirit of the confusion that has been in the community. I'm going to summarize our kind of argument, let you not argument, our perspective, our thought process. Again, we're not pro high volume, pro low volume, necessarily just trying to represent the data the best we can, then factor in the context of the, the data. So I'll, I'll summarize and then I'll, I'll kick it to you, Zach. So to start, again, the research question was not the relationship between hypertrophy and strength gains directly. So whether um, additional hypertrophy is leading to additional strength gain and the nature of, of those adaptations. But um, if you do want to use our data for insights, that's totally fine. Just keep in mind that it's apples and oranges. They're different data sets just because some studies didn't measure hypertrophy. Now, if you say, okay, they are different data sets. I understand this isn't really the research question. We would say, do they really disagree that much? 
like when you do research, you kind of see how the sausage is made, you understand that like those dose response relationships are not perfect by any means. They're definitely not the final say. We get more data, whatever the case may be. Like qualitatively, they're similar. They're qualitatively positive with diminishing returns and no clear inverted U. And they're different measurements. We don't really view them as fundamentally different curves. Particularly given the characteristics of the studies. Exactly. And that leads us into, or that doesn't really lead us into, but the next point I was going to say <laughs> is if you say, okay, I do think the curves are different. I do think that we can get some insight from this. Then we would say, okay, you really have to cut down the data quite a bit to only look at the matched effect where hypertrophy and strength are related from that study. In that case, you actually see reliability and agreement results that are compatible with them being decently related. Um, however, we don't really think that's the best way to get insights in the question if you want to get insights to the question of why the curves ultimately dis seem to disagree. And instead, we think the curves disagree because of specific limitations that probably are resulting in exaggerated, di exaggerated diminishing returns for strength, right? Things like the specificity of the training, things like the time scale of the intervention that are kind of flattening out that curve, whereas we might think it's, it's not as flat as early as it is in the data. And there are also possibilities for why the hypertrophy curve should really be more flattened out than it is because of things like swelling and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy that we just don't know a ton about. So ultimately, our view is that the dose response relationships between uh, volume and hypertrophy and volume and strength are compatible with the idea that as someone gains muscle, they also gain strength. So in other words, muscle growth is contributing to additional strength gain, even at those higher volumes. 100%. So just because you see one's flat and the other isn't, for the reasons we just spent a bunch of time going through, we don't necessarily think that that is something that isn't compatible with the data. But at the same time, we just don't know for sure with the data set because that's not what the data set is designed to answer. Another thing to keep in mind in terms of avoiding these hyper-specific conclusions is that these data sets are not the final say by any means. The model is wrong. I guarantee the models plural are wrong. I guarantee you that. They will change with more data and that's okay, right? Maybe there are improved statistical methods that like develop or the field evolves in, in that area as well. These, these are not the final word by any mean, and that is totally okay. There's always going to be more questions than answers, and ultimately, hopefully we've made it clear, the goal is to extract principles and not prescriptions. Yeah, I think ultimately the point of both the approximate descriptors and not precise predictors and then ultimately not making hyper-specific um, conclusions is just that you can take a linear meta-regression on protein, the, the, the root model from the hypertrophy, Meta regression, meta regression on volume, the reciprocal model from the strength, and you can you can get a specific number from it. But I view those much more as kind of conceptual anchors rather than exact numbers that kind of take into the gym. Obviously, the numbers they matter and they apply to some degree, but they are derived from the manifestations of the studies that are included in the meta analysis. So you have to consider the you know, the length of the studies, the, the exercise selection, the training quality, the specificity of training, particularly for strength, all of these considerations that we've already talked about, but the numbers are specific manifestations from those data sets. So when we talk about a linear effect of protein or a diminishing returns relationship for hypertrophy or strength, that's the way that we apply it as coaches. And that's the way we think about things conceptually is you have this entire backdrop of external environment variables, preferences, et cetera, when you actually go to apply these things. And that is just one factor of understanding the rough overall shape of these relationships to say, okay, out of all the changes I can make to a training program, they can help me kind of weigh those decisions to some degree and think about what direction I should take them given what I'm seeing in an individual's um, given case. So if I'm looking to optimize my gains in lean body mass, which aren't the same thing as hypertrophy necessarily, but let's just say that that's the case for from based on the, the Nunez meta regression, probably going to lean on the side of greater protein intakes. And thinking that's a relatively consistent effect throughout, at least I, I'm not sure if they looked at nonlinear models, but you know, just, just taking that as the case. It's not deriving the exact specific recommendation, like you said, at the very top end of the data range and saying that's not the best protein intake. That's not, that's not the way to responsibly apply those things because those exact numbers are manifestations of the data that was included in which your exact context could be entirely different. The principles are our best guess on what generalizes, but at the same time, the exact numbers, the exact uh, prescriptions are probably less helpful in that regard because of so many of the different underlying factors are just fundamentally different in practice in, in, in the populations that we typically communicate these things to.